share the word of God with you this morning. Um, Genesis 18, we're, we're continuing in this series in Genesis, we're in chapter 18, so I'd invite you to turn to your Bibles there, Genesis 18, we're going to pick it up at verse 16, we're going to carry all the way through to the end of the chapter, so that's verses 16 to 33, so turning your Bible there, just, just hang on for a second, and uh, as you're turning there, or, or swiping there, or scrolling there, or whatever it is you need to do to get there, um, I want to ask you this question, have you ever, or do you ever, try to bargain with God? Have you ever try to cut a deal? you ever try to make promises to God in hopes of exchange for mercy? I, I've done that a lot. Every time I'm at an amusement park and there's rides, you know, like a roller coaster or any kind of spinny ride or any kind of drop ride or anything like that, I'm not really into the rides. I'm not really, I don't really, I, I go on them mainly because my kids go and I want to go with them and that sort of thing, but it's not really something I enjoy and I find myself every time I'm about to go on one of these crazy rides by myself praying, dear Lord, get me through this, and I will live a perfect life for the rest of my life if you just get me through this. I don't know if that really works, but uh, that's what I do. It's silly. Now, this isn't exactly what we see in the story today, but there is this element of, of bartering, of this back and forth that Abraham has with God. So uh, let, let's just take a look at it here. Genesis 18, starting in verse 16, says, Then the men set out from there. They looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to, send, to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I, what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I, who am but dust and ashes, suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. He spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there. Answer, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way, and he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to this place. You know, sometimes, I don't know, maybe this is just me, maybe I'm not very smart, but when I read stories like that, initially, I ask myself, what in the world is going on here? What is this all about? How can I relate? I try to see myself in in a Bible story, and I, how do I relate to this? You know, I... God showing up like this. Like if we go back into the beginning of the chapter, chapter eighteen, it's, it's a strange story. God shows up at Abraham's place. A couple of angels, right? They have dinner. Apparently, it's a steak dinner. It's a calf, right? They kill the calf and milk or something. I don't know. They have this dinner, and and then God makes this ridiculous promise. This is what Ben talked about last week. He makes this ridiculous promise. It's a true promise. It's fulfilled, it's, it's of God, but it's crazy. It's a ridiculous promise about Sarah having a son. 
even though she and Abraham were old. It's crazy. It's crazy. And then after dinner, Abraham was walking these guys to see them on their way, you know, walking them to the door sort of thing. And, and, and God starts, I guess, thinking out loud about how he's going to bring Abraham in on his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Can anybody relate so far? Is this, is this something you've, you've experienced? You know, God shows up, you have dinner, and God says, hey, by the way, I'm going to destroy a couple of cities. And you know, How do we relate to this? You know? The other two carry on. The other two guys, they carry on. They head towards Sodom. God stays with Abraham. That's just the two of them. And they have this, this strange... Bartering session. Anybody ever barter for anything? Nobody. Okay. Oh, well, oh, yeah, fair. A couple, couple people. There's a strange bartering, this back and forth that goes on, and it's it's almost like a reverse auction. I've been to a couple of auctions, and and uh, usually the numbers go up, right? Usually this, in this case, the numbers are going down. He starts at 50, 45, 40, 30. Can I get 20? Anybody got 10? It's going down, down, down. And every time Abraham calls a new bid, God agrees. Waves his little thing or whatever. He, he goes for it. And then, and then, I think this is the worst part of the whole thing. <laughs> the chapter just ends there. Just ends. You know, they get to ten. That's it. Pack it up and go home. God carries it on. Abraham goes to his house. It's over. It stopped at ten. Why, why didn't it stop at ten? I don't know. It just, it just ends. So how do we make sense of this? How do we relate what do we learn from this? You know, maybe we can't relate in all of the details, right? But I think we can relate in the principles that I see in this text. So here's what I see. I see in this story, this passage, I see an important development. An important development in Abraham's relationship with God. We all have these defining moments, don't we? I think this is a defining moment for Abraham. That's why it's recorded in Scripture. It's an important moment. It's a, it's a development. Now, we can't, we, we, don't, we don't have the same experience that Abraham has. You know, the context of his, his interaction here with God is, is in the revelation to Abraham of God's plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So God reveals this plan to him. And then Abraham responds with a prayer, with intercession for Sodom. It's a development, it's a defining moment for Abraham. So let's take a closer look here. Verse 16 and 17. It says, the men looked down towards Sodom. Well, that's fairly ominous foreshadowing. Looking down towards Sodom. Abraham continues his good hospitality, walks with the men to see them off. And then in verse 17, there's this, God is thinking out loud, and he, it's almost like he's, he's explaining why he must, why he must bring Abraham in on his plan. Why he's choosing to do that. He says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? It's kind of a rhetorical question. He's not, he's not questioning himself. It's a rhetorical question. He says, of course, of course I can't keep this a secret from Abraham. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Why wouldn't I tell him? Why does God do that? Why does he do that? Well, I think for probably lots of reasons. Many I probably don't even understand, but I think one of the reasons is because Abraham was special. Abraham was special. In verses 18 and 19, we read that Abraham had a unique calling, a unique standing with God. It says there that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation. Anybody relate with that? Anybody here a great and mighty nation? This is a unique thing for Abraham. This is a special thing. Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation. All the nations of the earth. All the nations. Think about that for a minute. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. It's pretty important. It's pretty special. It's pretty unique. God says, I have chosen him. Abraham will instruct his children and household to keep God's way of righteousness and justice. And that God's promise would be fulfilled. Abraham. So Abraham has this incredibly special, this incredibly unique connection and relationship with God. And it's this, it's this intimate connection, it's this relationship that forms the basis, it forms the foundation of Abraham's intercessory prayer. That's the first thing, that's the first point I want to make today. 
is that powerful intercessory prayer begins with a strong personal relationship with God. Powerful intercessory prayer begins with a strong personal relationship with God. Think about it for a minute. Think about somebody you know, that you kind of know, that you have a thoroughly shallow and mediocre relationship with. Right? An acquaintance, somebody you happen to bump into every once in a while, somebody you talk to occasionally, you know, you're, you'd say you're friends, but you know, you don't really talk to that person. Right? And then one day you decide to, to approach that person and ask him or her to do some gigantic thing for you. Or on behalf of someone else. That would be a little awkward, wouldn't it? It would be a little strange. They probably wouldn't really do that. That's not really how it works. And then maybe that's not the best analogy, but I think you get my point. That powerful intercessory prayer begins with a strong personal relationship with God. And Abraham had that kind of relationship. He had that kind of connection with God. And in a few places in Scripture, Second Chronicles and Isaiah... James as well. Abraham is called a friend of God. That's a, that's a unique title. That's Not too many people get that title. Abraham was called a friend of God. This one maybe is a little silly, but uh, it's true that Abraham was the only Old Testament figure to have dinner with God. You know, the next people to dine with God was those who, uh, who dined with Jesus. Abraham walked with God, in this case literally, Abraham was chosen by God. So there's this deep connection, this relationship. Because of this, Abraham could draw near to God in the way he does in this story. So powerful intercessory prayer begins with a strong personal relationship with God. And secondly, powerful intercessory prayer depends on the nature and character of God. Depends on the nature and character of God. Can you imagine if intercessory prayer depended on my nature, on who I am? Imperfect, selfish me? I don't think it would work very well. So it depends on the nature and character of God. I, I, I find it so hopeful and faith building to know that when I pray, specifically when I pray or intercede on someone else's behalf, that I am praying to someone who actually hears me, who actually hears what I'm saying. It's not just waiting to talk. You know, we do that, right? We don't really listen to people. We're waiting to say the next thing that I want to say. God's actually listening. Sorry. And he can actually do something. He can actually do something. He's got the power and the ability and the capacity, the means to actually do something. And I'm encouraged as well to know that I'm praying to someone whose ways are perfect. Whose ways are perfect. Psalm 18 says, This God, our God, His way is perfect. And what that means to me is that I don't have to pray with the solution already in my mind. I don't have to pray to tell God what to do. You know, we do that a lot, don't we? Okay, God, I think I got it all figured out now. Here's what you should do. Okay. I don't have to pray while worrying that God might get it wrong. Because he's not going to get it wrong. His ways are perfect. So here in this text, we're told that God is righteous and just, and so when we call out to God in intercession, we can rest assured that God will always, always do what is right. He will always do what is just. The only problem, as I see it, is that he might not do what I want him to do. He might not do what I expect, or what I thought was going to happen. Right? He always does the right thing. Verses 20 and 21. So we see God brings Abraham. He reveals to Abraham his plans for Sodom and Gomorrah. But then he does something very interesting. He assures Abraham that he will go and check it out first. I'll go down and see if it's as bad as they say it is. And if not, I'll know. He says, I'll go check it out. Well, that's weird. 
weird. Why would God? That's strange. Why would God do that? Doesn't God already know everything? Of course He does. Of course He does. And not only that, but because He's righteous and just, Because the outcry of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was so great, God should not have bothered with this little reconnaissance mission. What he should have done, according to the the outcry of the sin, according to his righteousness and justice, he should have just wiped them out like yesterday, right? I think this is really more for Abraham's sake that he's doing this. See, not only is God righteous and just, but He's also merciful and compassionate. He knows the outcry from Sodom. He absolutely does. He hears it. He's repulsed by it, yet He's patient and long-suffering, giving them chance after chance. And I wonder sometimes if the world today isn't unlike Sodom and Gomorrah covered in the filth and stench of sin, God's great judgment looming, yet His mercy is new every morning. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? It's amazing. Powerful intercessory prayer depends on the nature and character of God. God who is righteous and just. God who is merciful and compassionate. He brings Abraham into this plan and then he invites, it's like he invites Abraham into this intercession that comes next. So let's take a look at, at that, at the nature of Abraham's intercession. The nature of Abraham's prayer. First of all, it was bold. Bold, this is verses 22 and 23. Notice the first two things. The first two things, before Abraham says a word. The first two things that he does as he enters into this intercession. It says that he still stood. In other words, he remained. He stayed there with God. You know, sometimes we just need to wait, don't we? Sometimes we just need to sit and wait with God and just be there. Just be a person in God's presence, right? And then it says that he drew near. He drew near. That seems rather bold to me. That seems incredibly bold. You know, Hebrews 4 in the New Testament talks about drawing near to the throne of grace with confidence. That, that's because of Jesus, this great high priest we have, who is our mediator. But this here, this is just Abraham and God one-on-one. When the prophet Isaiah encountered the Lord, he said, Woe is me, I am ruined. I'm ruined. The presence and the power and the holiness of God put the prophet Isaiah in his place. But here in this story, Genesis 18, Abraham stands remaining and then even drawing near to the Lord. And not only does he stand there with the Lord, but he even has the audacity to question his plan for Sodom. This is verses 24 and 25. He questions God's plan. He says, are you really going to do that, God? Are you really going to? Are you sure? You know, that's bold. That's really bold. But God seems to invite this boldness. He engages with Abraham. And he encourages this intercession. Why? Why? I think in part, it's because of the heart and spirit behind Abraham's intercession. You see, Abraham wasn't asking for anything for himself. You know, not like me on the roller coaster. God, get me through this. Get me. It's about me. Get me through this. And I'll... Don't fill in the blank. Abraham wasn't asking for anything for himself, but out of compassion, he was interceding for a city of sin. I mean, he's interceding for the righteous that may be there. He's essentially interceding for a city of sinners. And and also, perhaps, Lot's fate, you know, Lot was in his mind, but he knew his nephew Lot was there living in that area. That was a concern of his. So he's thinking about Lot. But what he's doing here is he's displaying for us that he shares the heart of God for the lost. This wasn't about Abraham. This is about those out there, the lost, those that need rescue. 
I also think that Abraham could be as bold as he was because of my first point, that powerful intercessory prayer begins with a strong relationship with God. And Abraham, as I already said, had that kind of relationship. So he could be bold. He could be bold. And his intercession was certainly bold, but it wasn't by any means perfect. It wasn't perfect. It was imperfect. Look at verses 24 and 25 again. He says, how, how, could, how could the righteous suffer the wicked? How, how could that, I don't understand that. You know? So here, Abraham presumes. He presumes something. He presumes that God would not allow the righteous to suffer along with the wicked. However, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's correct thinking. You know, think of all the tragic events in history. And even in recent times, just this last week. Massive earthquake in Italy. We all saw that on the news, probably. Massive earthquake in Italy. Dozens and dozens dead. Many more injured. Suffering and death. Surely, in that event, and in all these tragic events, surely there are some who are Christians suffering, dying. Surely there are righteous, wicked, suffering and dying alongside one another. You see... What Abraham didn't have was scriptures like Psalm 73, where King David laments about the prosperity of the wicked and the suffering of the righteous. He didn't have the words of Christ in Luke 13, 2 to 5, when Jesus explained to his disciples that sometimes tragedy happens to both the wicked and the righteous alike. He's talking about this tower that collapsed in 1890. He said, Do you think, you think those people were worse <laughs> sinners? Abraham didn't quite have it together in terms of correct thinking. He didn't have all the facts straight, perhaps. The prayer was bold, it was, it was imperfect. And here's the great thing about it, is that God doesn't seem to mind one little bit. He doesn't seem to bother God. You know, look at verse 26. Verse 26, God agrees with Abraham. He places the first bid in Abraham's reverse auction. And isn't that an encouragement to us today? That, that imperfection, that's an encouragement to us today that when, to know that when we pray, when we intercede for others, that we don't have to get every little detail perfectly correct. That we don't have to have a PhD in theology in order to call out to God. What freedom we have in Christ that we can indeed approach the throne of grace with confidence. As imperfect as we are, and how we get it wrong, so many, we, can, we can come to the throne of grace. Why? How? Well, it's on the basis of a right relationship with God. Through Christ, through Jesus, it's because of a dependence on the perfection of a righteous and just and merciful, compassionate God. Which brings me the next aspect of the nature of Abraham's prayer. It was bold, it was imperfect, but it was also humble. It was also humble. More specifically, Abraham was humble. Look at what he says in verse 27. He says, Behold, I have undertaken to speak, in, uh, undertaken to, speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Abraham has this sudden realization that, Whoa, I'm I'm nothing. Here. <laughs> I am but dust and ashes. And then in verse 30 and 31 and 32, there's all these statements of humility. He's basically saying, oh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I, I'm speaking to God. I'm speaking to God. This is crazy. Okay, God, just don't get mad. Just one more thing. Just one more. I'm just going to say one more thing. You know, and there's this humility that's there. It's mixed with the boldness. There's an understanding on some level that this is God, He is God, I am not. And, and that this whole idea of trying to barter, trying to negotiate with God is, is really strange because actually I've got nothing. I've got nothing. You know, God holds all the chips, He's got all the cards, He's got the whole table, in fact. And so Abraham was humble in his approach to God. And finally, number four, Abraham's intercession was persistent. It was persistent. 
You know, he could have stopped at 50. Why did he start at 50? I don't know. He started at 50 for some reason. He could have stopped there. He could have been happy with, okay, 50, good enough. Okay, let's go home. No, he kept going. He kept going. 45. Goes down by five at first, you know. 50, 45, 40. And then he starts dropping by tens. How about 30, God? 20? 10? You know? He kept going. How persistent are we? How persistent am I in my intercession in my prayer life? Not very sometimes. The Apostle Paul instructs us to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. And Jesus said that we should pray and not lose heart. Ever lose heart? Trying to pray for something, somebody. Sort of this, uh, it's too hard. For a variety of reasons, we seem to give up quickly. We forget. We think it's not important anymore. We, we get satisfied. We think, oh, it's good enough. It's good enough. We'll stop there. You know? How do you know if it's good enough? What will it take? system in prayer. So that's kind of the end of the story. And it's a bit of an abrupt ending. You know, uh, Abraham gets God down to ten. And then the chapter ends. Chapter ends. I can't delve too deeply into the next chapter and the rest of the story. That's the upcoming messages. Uh, other than to say, uh, and in case you didn't already know, spoiler alert, God destroys Sodom. And Gomorrah. Wipes them both out. Which I find absolutely intriguing. Because we just come through this whole thing. You know, Abraham's saying, well, you know, will you spare it for this many righteous at least? Will you spare it? He's interceding for Sodom, and in the end, God destroys Sodom after all. Because there wasn't any righteous there. Well, so that was Abraham's prayer. It's for, for 50, for 45. For, these, for this many righteous, will you. Apparently there wasn't any righteousness of God destroying Sodom after all. And what I take away from that is that sometimes things don't go the way we thought they were going to go. Things don't go the way we expect always. Things don't we don't always get what we want, right? We don't always get what, what we thought was what God was going to do. But know this, that God always does what is just. He always does the right thing. He's righteous, right? It doesn't always feel good. It doesn't feel good to know that these two cities were absolutely destroyed. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel nice. I don't want to leave it on a downer, but uh, that's the reality. But there is, in this story, a glimmer of hope. Because if you look ahead in the next chapter, there is one that is rescued. Is one that is rescued. Lot. Remember Lot? Remember that guy? Abraham's nephew? Lot, who was a foreigner to Sodom. He wasn't a citizen. He wasn't one of them, really. He was kind of living on the outskirts of town. I don't know what his engagement was with the people there. Whatever. But he was a foreigner. He, Lot, you know, who maybe on the surface wasn't the most righteous looking guy. Peter, later in the New Testament, does call him righteous Lot, but. But generally, when you read the story, you kind of look a lot and go, ah, that guy's got some problems. He's got some issues. Lot, though, by God's great mercy. It says there that, that, that the Lord was merciful. The Lord was merciful to Lot. So by God's great mercy, Lot was rescued from the overthrow, from the judgment and destruction. And aren't we kind of like Lot? You know, maybe that's where I can relate to this story. Maybe that's where I see myself. Kind of like Lot, you know, foreigners, aliens, sojourners in this world. Don't really belong here. Totally unable to save myself with any righteousness of my own. 
wholly and utterly dependent on the mercy of another. That's the gospel. That's the gospel right there. That's the good news that Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, has made a way for his righteousness, because I got none, I got nothing. He's made a way for his righteousness to be imputed, to be placed on me, that the justice and the judgment, the righteousness and ju justice of God that was due to, to me has been executed on Christ on my behalf. He took my place. That's good news. Do you agree? So, wrap this up here and I uh, just want to encourage you. To encourage you today, church. Whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, maybe you're here today and you're not you're not a Christian, you know, you've never experienced the salvation of God. Or maybe you are a Christian and, and you're you've got a situation that you're thinking of that you're praying for. Someone in your family yourself, maybe a friend, maybe a situation in the world today is heavy in your heart. Whatever it is, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, where, whoever you are, wherever you are, I want to encourage you to call on God today. Call on God today. Cry out to Him. And we think of all kinds of other things to try first, don't we? Before we come to God, before we call on Him, before we pray. We try this, we try that, we try the other thing. Trying to figure out the solution. Uh, I do. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Maybe you guys are way, way better than me on that. But I, I, I get all worked up and stressed out and worried. And eventually, when things get desperate enough, I come around and I pray. Why don't I pray first? So can I encourage you in that? Call on him today. Cry out to him. Come humbly. Come yet with boldness. Come as you are. Just as you are with all of your imperfections, all of your wrong thinking. Abraham wasn't thinking right. Theologically, you know. But he came to God and he said, God, I don't understand. Are you going to do this? Can you, can you help me understand this? Come to God with your questions. Persistently intercede for yourself, for your family, for your community, for your world. And on that note, I'd like to take a moment and have us just pray. Before I, before I say any more, you know, we have a lot of talking in church, don't we? We have a lot of talking. That's, that's not a bad thing, it's, it's not part of it. We have music and there's all always something going on, but I want to take just like a minute or less and pray silently. The room's going to be quiet and it'll feel weird, whatever, but I don't, I don't care. It's you and God. You and God. For just a minute. And if there's something weighing heavy on your heart, call out to Him. Cry out to Him today. Let's do that right now. So, Lord, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for this passage of scripture. Thank you for Genesis 18, 16, 33. Thank you that it's there and we can read it, we can study, we can learn from it. Thank you that it, it is truth. 
And then, Lord, not only can we learn from it and all of that, but we can actually do something now. We can actually put it into action. In your strength, by the power of your spirit working in us, we can now go and pray. We can intercede. We can actually take action, Lord. Lord, we call on you today. So desperately. We need you in our lives. We need you in our families, in our marriages, in our community, in our world, God. Sometimes it looks like things are such a mess. Lord, have mercy, Christ. Have mercy. God, inspire us. Inspire us. Encourage us. Prod us, Lord, to pray. God, I pray that you would put a burning discontent in us that could only be satisfied by your presence, by prayer, by intercession, Lord, call us as your church, as your called out ones. Call us to intercede for those around us, for our communities, Lord, for Salmon Arm, Sycamus, Sorrento, Chase, Enderby, whole region, Lord, call us to intercede for the people around us. Father, bring us into a place of intimacy with you. Personally, individually, relationally, bring us into a place of intimacy with you, a place of, of boldness, yet a place of humility, and certainly a place of persistence. God, we call on you and just, you who are merciful and compassionate, Lord, we look to you today. We look to you today. We cry out to you, Lord. Stir our hearts. Stir our hearts to brokenness and to action as we respond now to your word with this expression of praise and worship. This expression of praise through this music, Lord, this, this music that is not just singing some songs, but it is it is our expression of gratitude and honor to you, God. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just stand and continue to worship God.